All right, go ahead. There you go. Okay. This is the call, the April 20th, 2021 Wilmette Board of Trustee meeting to order. All the proper notices have been given and trustee and director uh, Austin is meeting from the library and the rest of us are on Zoom. So trustee Barshis, do it's you mind doing more. the roll? Oh, oh, give me one. Give me one second. <laughs> okay. How are you, Dan? I'm good. I'm I'm doing double duty. The House of Reps is going real late, so I'm I'm double zooming. I may need to jump to go testify. But how are you doing? Okay. We have dueling Zooms here tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee here. Johnson? Here. Trustee Riddle? Here. Okay. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Here. Trustee McDonald? Here. Thank you. Okay. At this time, it's a time that we uh, allow the public to do public comments. Anybody who wishes to address the Board of Trustees can do so at this time. Is there anyone that would like to address us? Going once, twice, nobody sold. Okay. Moving on, there is no one that will be doing addressing us today. So right behind uh, the agenda, you've got the minutes from the March 16th, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion? Can we have a motion to adopt the minutes? A motion to approve the uh, minutes from our previous meeting. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Trustee Wolf has motion to approve the minutes and Trustee Fit Fishman has seconded the motion. Is there any discussion regarding the minutes? Okay. okay. It's been moved and seconded. Can we have the roll call to approve the minutes? Trustee Barshis? Trustee Barshis. Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Riddle? Sorry. It's out of order. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Oh, I said I. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Rogers. Yes. Andy Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. At this time, there are no presentations, so we will move to the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers. Okay. A um, couple of things. One is we received one point six million in. Property taxes, $41,573 from the Kenilworth Library District contract and $5,300 in general fund interest. There is an anomaly in this month's report. Um, <clears throat> the reason that the general fund expenditures are shown as 65% um, is because the March payroll actually landed into the account on April 1st instead of on March 31st. Had it been included, we would be at 69% instead of 65%. Uh, in addition to that, the fourth quarter typically is when purchases of computers and furnishings um, that are in the budget uh, typically occur. And so uh, we do anticipate that the end of year balance will be very close to what we forecast in the budget. Uh, there is no anticipated large surplus. It is strictly an anomaly uh, based on the fact that payroll did not get recorded at the end of March as it usually would be. It, would, it was recorded on April 1. So the April 1 figures when we look at the next financial report will show an additional um, uh, uh, 
uh, charge, additional charges for payroll. Uh, there's nothing else extraordinary in the report. Are there any questions? Just briefly, do we anticipate ending up around 95, 92, 98? Is it too early to tell? That's too fine a line to cut this far in advance. It depends on when, what bids come in at for the remaining purchases of things like computers and furnishings. Um, we really don't know that to, in that level of detail um, three quarters of the way through the year. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> if there are no questions about the financial report, uh, the next item then would be uh, payment of bills and salaries. Um, you have that as an attachment in the materials. I move approval of the bills and salaries for March. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Rogers to uh, approve the bills and salaries. It's been seconded by Trustee Wolf. Is there any discussion? Barring no discussion, can we have the roll call to approve the March 31st bills and salaries? Yes, Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. Trust It looks like Jan is froze. froze. I think she froze. I think Jan froze. You want me to finish calling it? I can step in and, and call. Okay, do that. Yeah, thanks. All right. So I did hear that Trustee Barsha said yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Okay. In terms of action items, uh, we're moving on to action items and the next uh, order of business is to schedule a finance committee meeting to begin the budget. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that, Ron? Trustee Rogers? Um, well, the next, the next, um action or activity of the finance meeting to uh, the preliminary meeting to uh, evaluate or, or consider the budget for the coming fiscal year. Um, this is about the time when we normally would do that. And this is in the agenda in order for us to schedule a meeting of the finance committee uh, prior to the May meeting. Sorry to interrupt, Jan, you're back on, so you're, it's working for you. I think we hear you. Sorry to interrupt, Ron. Anthony, did you want to add anything further to scheduling? Um, we just have a couple committee meetings that are going to be coming up, obviously. So the finance committee meeting is one of our priorities, and we'd like to hold this meeting in advance of our May 18 regular meeting, which is going to be... Um, um, a transitional meeting for us. That is the date at which we're going to be swearing in our new trustees. Um, so it would be, I think, prudent for us to begin this conversation about the budget here um, in advance of that so that there's some grounding for our incoming board so that they have an opportunity to um, sit in on the committee meeting with the current board, see uh, the budget process in progress, um, and be able to take up that mantle um, after they've been sworn in um, for a subsequent committee meeting. Um, so that's one of our, our milestones. Um, I will send out a doodle poll to you all following our meeting tonight, and we'll set a date for early May for that meeting. Um, there's also another committee meeting that we'll need to do here in the near term as well, and that relates to our policy committee. Um, staff has received more policy information um, from our attorneys, and we have a new draft policy as well that we've prepared for you um, regarding our library cards and accounts. That's the next chapter that's up for review. Um, so that's another meeting I'd like to hold here soon, but obviously our first priority and what's on the agenda and what we're talking about right now is setting a date for our finance committee meeting. 
Um, so I will send out a doodle poll. Um, if there's any, one, any dates that are, that are out um, that you know for certain right now, that'd be good for us so that we don't waste our time trying to schedule something around those dates. Otherwise, we'll just target um, uh, sometime during the, the work day on um, Monday through Friday um, in early May. Okay. You want to, is it okay to move for discussion item? Are there any questions in terms of the budgeting process? Um, I guess it's just procedurally or process. Should we, did you want to like um, include the non board members that might want to participate in the doodle poll too? Is sort of a courtesy? Definitely. I can certainly do that. Thank you, Dan. That's a great suggestion. Um, all three of our incoming trustees are on the call with us this evening. Um, so I will be reaching out to all of you. We have been corresponding via email for the last uh, couple weeks um, and gathering up some orientation materials. So I will certainly invite you all to attend this meeting as a matter of course as well. Okay. We had a policy committee. I'm, I'm moving to discussion item. Any other, any other things before we move on regarding the budgeting process? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the discussion items we had, we had a policy committee and I think Director Austin has already told you that it's gone back to the staff. Originally we had a glass of water. Jan, can we mute you? Okay. Originally it had gone, uh, it had been approved but with pending uh, a review by the uh, attorney and so the attorney came back with lots of more comments. So right now it's being reviewed by the staff and then uh, it will be reviewed by the committee. So that's the status of the policy. And that was basically the operations policy which went from two pages to about 16 or 17 pages. Okay, and a uh, pandemic response plan update, Director Austin. Yeah, um, <clears throat> nothing really to, to report in terms of the pandemic response per se. At this point, um, um, all staff have had the opportunity to opt into um, receiving a vaccination. Um, we're not collecting the data on this. Um, it's not a condition of employment, but um, every staff member has been offered the opportunity to do so. And um, many have received um, their, even up through their second dose. I received my second dose on Friday. Um, so a number of us have gone through this process. Um, so the staff is generally taken care of as far as that's concerned. Um, a number of folks have taken part in the community clinic that was set forth by the village um, in a partnership with our community out at um, Nutrier West. Um, so in terms of you know, operations and our response plan here locally, some of this relates to the RFID project, so I can get in, into that detail here in a moment. Um, I will say that there was one bit of news that, that took place at the system level related to the pandemic response plan, and that was a decision from Rails um, regarding information regarding the quarantine of materials. Um, Rails elected based upon um, data that was shared through the CDC and a number of other studies as we've been following the Realm study. Um, that cites that the transmission of the virus is primarily done through droplets in the air as it is a respiratory disease and that the transmission of the virus does not seem to be um, indicative on physical objects themselves, which relates to the circulation of our collections. So um, based upon that data, Rails um, gave the guidance to um, uh, all of its members to uh, suspend their activity of quarantining the delivery materials. Um, as a matter of course, we've been quarantining all of our materials um, for a matter of days since the pandemic began. Um, it, it began with kind of a full scale quarantine where we weren't accepting any returns whatsoever during that period um, in April and then into May when we started accepting returns again. Gradually moved into a phase of about three days and in more recent times we've been quarantining for 48 hours. Delivery materials um, had their own set of uh, requirements that were set up by Rails and CCS. And um, that is what we're talking about here. So uh, the requirement was materials needed to be quarantined before they were sent off in Rails because individual libraries had their own response strategies. And the only way that the receiving library could be reasonably assured um, that the drivers and um, any space in between the libraries 
um, had, had quarantined for a reasonable amount of time was to establish some boundaries and, and establish a, a set of days for that. So when Rails relaxed that, uh, that put the onus back on individual organizations to determine what their response plan is. Uh, CCS last week at our governing board meeting um, um, affirmed what Rails, uh, what Rails's vote was. We had originally agreed to do that as part of our agreement with CCS. Um, so now it's back to individual libraries and our own uh, quarantine procedures. At this time, Wilmet Library is continuing to quarantine our materials for 48 hours. Um, and we will continue to evaluate the data to determine if this is the appropriate response time for us. But the, the turnaround time for our holds material and so on um, has been reasonable. And um, as, there, as there are no penalties right now for late fees, um, there, it's, it's, the, the impact on our service is, is relatively nominal. Um, so it's, it's just, uh, this is some information that was being shared through Rails and CCS, and I think it was pertinent for me to share that information with you here. Um, the other detail I wanted to share with you is that we are making some preparation. Go ahead, Lisa. You're muted. Given that most of the staff will have shots, what will change in terms of the operation and how you're utilizing personnel in the library? Well, I think the short answer to that is not much will change. Um, we do foresee that um, masking and social distancing is going to continue as is. Um, we do have our partitions in place, those will remain. Um, there are some staff that are spread throughout the building in various offices. Um, in an effort to try to abide by our social distancing guidelines. And in a number of those cases, that strategy will need to continue for the foreseeable future. I do see that relaxing a little bit as we move forward, um, but I don't have any immediate plans to, to make those changes in terms of opening up the study rooms or even the auditorium. Um, there, there are some other contingencies that are non-pandemic related, but relate to our capital repair project this summer that will also be impactful on some of our spaces in the building too. Um, but in terms of actual staffing levels and so on, um, what I have directed the leadership team to do at this time is to go back and evaluate our remote work policies and agreements with individual staff members. And uh, our goal is to try to bring the, um, as many of the staff back into the building um, as, as is reasonable and as is possible. A number of our staff are able to work remotely and some of them will need to continue to do so for um, individual arrangement purposes. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna, we're gonna start seeing um, a general return back to the building so that we can begin preparing for what looks like a return to some degree of normalcy um, beginning after Labor Day. Um, and Labor Day is kind of the date that I'm, that I'm citing for a number of things because that also falls right after our capital repair project on the interior of the building with the replacement of the electrical panel that's gonna require a bit of closure um, during the month of August. So um, what that means come, come that time, we'll be able to reopen some spaces. Um, I imagine by then um, we'll have a few more months behind us. Um, we'll have a clearer picture. I, I hope we'll have a clearer picture of what the pandemic looks like in terms of our, our local operations. And we'll be able to start introducing, uh, reintroducing some of the services that have been um, abbreviated during this time. So that would pro probably be around the time when we would see additional seating restored, study rooms perhaps being offered again. Um, we may even see a, a gradual return to some in-person programming at that time. It's too soon to speculate about those details. Um, we do anticipate some in-person programming um, on the outside uh, this summer as part of our summer reading clubs, but inside the building, our spaces are still largely occupied and I don't foresee us um, taking the, those steps um, until much later. So it's too soon for me to comment on that. Um, but I think, does that answer kind of obliquely the question that you had, Lisa? People are curious as to, you know, when you start getting everybody in terms of, i.e. herd immunity or whatever they want to call it, will there be, when will the program start returning? So I think that's on a lot of people's minds and, you know, being able to come a little bit and sit down in the library. Of course, obviously our, our goal is going to remain the safety of our community and the safety of our staff. Um, we know that we can do so within the structures that we've got currently. Um, I think our door counts have been, have been reasonable. Um, we're, we have not had to have anyone wait to come in the building. Um, and most everyone does abide by the, the basic guidelines of come in, do your business and, and move along. Um, circulation's remaining steady. Um, our service model appears to be working. 
Um, we do know that we're coming into finals period here in May. And um, I think maybe to coincide with that, we will see the return of some additional um, study options. Um, we did remove some of the seating, or, or rather we removed some of the, the shelving that was on the mezzanine level. And that's opened up some space that I believe is gonna be an opportunity for us to reintroduce some degree of tables and seating um, at a reasonable distance away from a lot of the other activity in the library. So we're looking for some strategies that we can incrementally start moving back into um, some of the experiences that patrons are hoping to find when they come in the library. Um, but, but so far, um, this model appears to continue to work for us. Um, folks are not having to wait for services. Um, the computer room usage seems to turn over um, as, uh, as quickly as it can. Um, we're, we're not seeing a lot of waiting. We're not seeing any waiting, really, frankly. So um, I'm, I'll take any questions that you may have, but I think that's kind of where we're at right now with our response plan. Just briefly, if I may, uh, I encourage you to encourage your staff to think about any uh, outdoor activities, especially on the youth side. Uh, if the weather warms up and you got our gorgeous lawn, um, you know, maybe we could think about maxing out some, uh, you know, story time and, and do a lot more outdoors, especially if the staff's now fully vaccinated. So appreciate the opportunity to, to plant that seed. Thank you, Dan. Yes, definitely. That, those, are, those are in the plans and works for the summer. And you did a good job with doing Poetry Month in terms of how you've spaced the signs and the little tree. The poets, the, the poems on the tree. Will you ever take any of them down and perhaps publish some of them as to what the kids submitted on the page? I don't know what the plans are for the, the actual poems that are posted on the uh -huh. tree, but I like that idea. I, th I think that's something that we could certainly do to try to share more of that information, but it's true. Lisa's referring to, it is Poetry Month here in April, and the library does have an installation on our lawn, um, kind, of like a, kind of like our story walk and kind of like the Burma Shave signs, I guess, um, where the, the concept is to go around and... Uh, um, and follow the progress of this poem that celebrates poetry. We've also got a number of poems that have been posted in the windows around the library, making it a bit of a destination and encouraging people to engage in the love of, of reading and poetry. Um, and our patrons are encouraged to contribute their own and to write poetry um, to add to our poet trees um, on the lawn. So not all of our trees are immediately accessible due to the construction fencing, which is the next item on my, my list here to discuss with you. Um, but we do have a couple trees that have been targeted to receive these poems, and there's actually quite a few on there already right now. So, and that just started here in the last week. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, anything else about our pandemic response plan before I move on to the um, project updates? Okay, so um, projects. I will start with the construction project. So um, the capital repair project is well underway. Um, the only trade that's currently um, uh, working right now is our tuck pointing crew. Um, Berglund has been an outstanding hire. I'm, I'm really thrilled um, that they were our low bidder on this project. Their quality and attention to detail is right on page with the expectations that our Wilmet community would have. Um, I'm really impressed by our foreman and his daily communications with myself and our facilities manager, Marcos Levy. Um, each day, um, we're aware of, of where they're working. And um, if you've been around the building and you've had an opportunity to see the site, um, I'm sure you can tell a difference in the condition of the brick. Just, just from the cleaning alone, uh, the power washing um, is, is really, it's very impactful. You can see just how how clean the brick is, or rather how dirty it was. Um, that team is also simultaneously going around and incrementally removing a lot of the, uh, the caulk sealant that's around all of the, uh, the uh, there's a number of junction joints um, in the brick that's, uh, there are vertical joints on the building, as well as all of the, uh, uh, the points where the flashing meets with the, the windows and the doors around the building. They're uh, removing all of that caulking. Um, a lot of that is cracked, um, having not been repaired or replaced in a number of years, and that's all getting resealed again. So that will help with our water infiltration. 
They're also simultaneously going through and grinding out a lot of the mortar joints in the bricks. That's the tuck pointing part of the project. And um, they've, they've been able to match the grout really well. Um, it, it looks really great. Um, it is a little bit noisy at times between um, you know, the early morning hours and about 2 p.m. each day. Um, so sometimes our, our chairs are rattling as they're going through grinding out um, the grout around us. Um, but the, the results are really quite impressive. Um, having walked the roof with the team recently, uh, the coping stones, those are the, 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 uh, the keystones at the top of, of each wall, um, have all been deep cleaned. They were, they were practically black um, with mildew and they are now shining um, a concrete gray and all the mortar joints there have been replaced. Um, we do know that that was um, one of the sites that was indicated as a point of water infiltration and that that water was running down through the building. So we know that this is the first phase of uh, treatment for those leaks that we've experienced on the lower level, particularly on the south side of the building. Um, I will let you know that um, we, we will have more information here soon about when that crew is gonna begin inside work on the installation of that drain. Um, on the lower level, um, but at this point that crew has not been mobilized yet and they're not yet, not yet part of our construction crew. Um, once the, the tuck pointing crew is able to um, um, demobilize, I guess, and, and start breaking down their equipment, that's when the roofing crew will start to ramp up their work. But we still have probably about 10 weeks left of the uh, tuck pointing work before we're gonna see the roof crews on site. Um, so I'll keep you updated there. There is a, web, a website that we've dedicated to the project that is up um, is, and is online. Um, there's a picture up there right now. It was also in my report that's, that's showing that, that tuck pointing crew in, in progress. We are taking progress photos as is the crew and um, we will update that page with more information as soon as I've got more details to share with you. Uh, that construction fencing that is along the south side of the building will remain there um, for the duration I think of at least probably through June until the, the roof portion of the project is completed. Um, there's going to be a lot of equipment that's going to be need to be um, loaded onto the roof and so on. So um, in addition to this, uh, this lift that's out there right now, there will be other equipment that will be coming up there um, in the coming weeks. So that fencing is going to remain there. Um, the fencing has kind of delayed some of our, our regular spring grounds maintenance. However, we do have a new grounds maintenance crew that's going to be coming in. Um, I have detail about that in my report and I can get, well, I can just cover that now, I guess, since we're on the subject. Um, our facilities manager, Marcos, did do um, a, uh, a request for proposals for, um, for that information. And you can find um, actually the, the results of our study on page 15 of my report. Um, really impressed with the results of that study and um, the, that request for proposals. Um, the company that we selected has come on site um, and has already done an assessment. They're gonna do a spring cleanup for us here very shortly after the tuck pointing crew is able to move out of like the garden area. And um, they've identified a number of projects that they're gonna get underway for us, including removing a lot of the weeds that have accumulated here um, since the spring has popped up. So, um, like I said, we'll, we'll start to see a little bit more activity around the grounds and, and the beautification of our space um, will start to be restored again here very soon. Um, any questions about the capital project or about the grounds? Okay, um, I can give you a brief up. Oh yeah, go ahead, Lisa, um, and you're muted. Is there a link on the front page? Because I went looking as to the updates for the construction. Um, it's under about. Uh, it's, it's part of the projects page that's listed under about. There's only four content blocks on the front page and those are used for the highest impact programs um, and the immediate services. But um, the construction project is listed under about with projects. Anyone, I mean, but how often do they, I'm just wondering, could there be just a little flag to see what's going on at the, with a link to that? Because I don't think, I wouldn't intuitively know to go look for about because I went scrolling trying to figure it out. And I'm just wondering if there's some way that, that can be highlighted. Well, updates thank you. I, I appreciate that. As you know, that this is one of the challenges of our website. It, it has pretty um, locked in content blocks that make communication about details like this a little bit more challenging to post up. It could be clustered in with um, the service update um, banner that drops down when you first load the page that, that has the link to our current service model. 
that would be a point that we could link from. Um, but the four content blocks on the front page are really are really their high real estate. You know, that they're used for our highest impact services and um, dedicating uh, a page or, or one of those content blocks directly for this purpose, I, I think would not be the best communication resource. But I'll certainly take whatever whatever guidance you want to provide on that. I think it needs to be more visible because I think people are wondering what's going on at the library mm -hmm. when they pass. And that's the only reason I'm, you know, they go there, even though most of the time I'm on my app or, you know, either the app or that. I'm just wondering if there can be just one sentence with a link, you know, what's going on, just highlight it in a different color so they can just link to it and go to the about page without having to search in okay. the interim, because it'll be going on before that website's finished. I was just going to make a comment today. Someone at the um, vaccine um, at Nature West, it, I was talking with her and said I was a library trustee volunteering and she said her comment was, what are they doing at the library again? And I fended, I felt like I fended off, you know, explained, but I, to Lisa's point, I think a little bit of information, if it's possible, would be useful because it would have been nice to know I could send this uh, patron to get more information. I, I did my best, but um, for what it's worth, it just came up today. They're working on the building again, was her comment. Okay. Well, and as you know, working on the building is a, is a full-time project at a, at a public facility. So um, we, are, we are making that investment in the facility. We can, we can um, reevaluate the way that we do the communication about this. Um, please do inform your constituents that we have a website dedicated specifically to the project. And I will work with Stephen to see if there's a way that we can um, allocate more real estate on the front page of the website directing people to that page. Thank you. I would note that you do home remodeling and repair projects on an ongoing basis as they're needed. And that's really no different than what's going on at the library. I understand that, but the taxpayers are paying for it. And I, I think because the sidewalk is blocked off, it's, they're curious about it. That's all in terms of just informing them. But I know we, do, but then you put the big license thing or whatever, the permit from the city. But I understand that, but I think it's sort of different. Well, improving the communication is worthwhile. The projects themselves are not that extraordinary. No, I know. They're just routine maintenance, but I think that needs to be explained. Well, some of them are not so routine, like when we have to close the building for the electrical work and when the parking lot is being um, recondition, shall we say. Um, but, you know, I'm, every few years I have to do that with the brick in my own driveway. So, you know, those are things that you just have to keep up with in order to prevent deterioration uh, of what you've invested to have a, a comfortable and usable facility. I don't think people are questioning the expense. I think what they need to know is that it is routine and just to reinforce mm -hmm. exactly how extensive it's going to be and the impact. That's all. Well, and the communication on it can be improved. There's no question about that. Okay, thank you for your feedback on that. Um, anything else about the capital project or the grounds? Can I, uh, am I on now? Yes, you are, Jan. Okay, <laughs> I just have a question. Uh, in relation to what this woman said, um, what would you say was the last time that um, repairs like that occurred at the library in such a substantial amount or, you know, looking like it looks now? What would she have been referring to, do you think? Well, probably the outside renovation project from 2018. Landscaping. Yeah. So, and that's, that's not like just yesterday. So it's uh, maybe if you don't follow the library along, it may feel like yesterday, but if there are a lot of people who think that, then it's really important to make sure that they know what's happening and that it's not just, you know, one year we do this, the next year we do that, you know, but what we have going now is not something that just occurred before. Well, and that was my response that, you know, it, it's like, and to, the, to everyone's point, 
it's a building like anything else. You have to maintain it. And it's an older building with with right. different parts and additions and roofs and, and so forth. We, we kept it light, but um, just that she brought that up, I think, mm -hmm. some feedback to share with everyone that um, people are, are questioning or, or wondering. And um, that's that's all. But I did, re I, I did mention to her that it's like anything else. It's an older building and it needs maintenance. So the question makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and very few people are aware that we're dealing with a building that the core of which was was uh, constructed in the 1950s, and um, you know, those are uh, you know those are things that occur. We have 11 different roofing services, right? Um, and they're not all in the same calendar, so almost any three-year period that you throw a dart at, you're going to have to do something. And that's, you know, that's just part of the, the landscape of maintaining a public building that has been um, constructed and assembled uh, in stages over a very long period of time. We're over 70 years um, with essentially the same core building. Uh, obviously, we've kept it up to date. We've made changes, but the maintenance uh, is partly uh, triggered by the age of the original building. So you're absolutely right that it's, you know, it's not a new building. I mean, parts of it are newer than others, but, you know, those are things that just have to be maintained over time. Okay, um, moving on to the next project update. Um, so the website, I'll, st I'll just go there. <laughs> um, our, um, our project planning is underway. We've engaged Library Market. Um, our project will be kicking off officially with our, with our uh, project manager in early May. And um, in the meantime, uh, staff in our committee um, is already well ahead of, their, of the curve. We had an, a quick engagement meeting with our project manager last week. And um, they gave us some homework, we gave them some homework, and we're all in our respective corners doing our, our projects and inventory and so on, um, getting prepared for that actual onboarding and kickoff meeting that we're gonna have in early May when things will really get going in earnest. Um, so we're excited for that opportunity um, here very shortly. Um, so that's the website project, not a lot to share at this point, but at the next meeting, definitely more. Um, and the other big project that we have going on is our RFID project. So the radio frequency mm -hmm. identification tagging project continues. And today was a major milestone for us. Um, last week, we wrapped up work on the second floor, having tagged um, basically the entire youth services collection. That is the largest collection in the library. So the entire second floor, um, save for the compact discs, um, has been completed and the entire print collection on the first floor has been completed. So uh, Patsy and her team moved down to uh, the lower level and will commence um, the nonfiction collection, the adult nonfiction collection here um, today. So we're thrilled about that. Um, we're moving along at a real fast clip. And um, the final phase of the project will be as we kind of wrap around into the 900s. So we're, we're starting kind of geographically um, on the east side of the lower level and we'll work our way um, basically towards the northwest of the building uh, when we wrap up there in the 900s and with a nonfiction DVD collection. The last phase of the project will be going upstairs again to the first floor media room. And we have some, um, an interesting development in there. Knowing that we're going to be touching every single item in the media collection gave us an opportunity to evaluate um, how we package some of our, um, our resources. And um, we've evaluated a new kind of case for our compact disc collection, or at least the majority of the, of the compact disc collection. Uh, the single disc and double disc sets that are in jewel cases are eligible to be replaced um, in a, a thin acrylic sleeve. We've seen a number of our partner agencies have been doing this for a, a, a while now. We see it through our um, interlibrary loans um, through CCS and so on. 
Um, so we did some investigative research there to determine if it was the right fit for us here at Wilmette. And um, we've determined that in fact it is. Um, we can fit far more CDs in a smaller space. It's a better use of the space in that room, which is already kind of compacted. And it will give us an opportunity to grow a little bit um, and hopefully present that collection in a way that's a little bit more alluring and doesn't require as much maintenance. The jewel cases tend to break when they land in the book drop. It's been a pervasive issue for us for years. And this is gonna be a way for us to um, better manage that collection uh, going forward. So we're gonna make an investment in some new cases for those. Um, they'll look prettier because they won't all be worn. Um, and it'll take a little bit longer to do it, but we're gonna do it right um, since we're gonna be tagging them all anyway. So that's a project that will be coming on here very shortly. Um, we had our gates installed today too. That was a major milestone for us. So a week or so ago, we um, took down the old gates. Our electrician who's gonna be working on the, the end phase of our capital project helped to core a couple holes in the floor at the entrance for our brand new gates. And we got those all set up and installed and configured today. Um, we previously had two aisles that were at the entrance and they were narrow three foot aisles. We now have a single um, five and a half foot aisle that's easier to walk through at the front entrance. And they're, um, I, I guess as far as security infrastructure goes, they're more attractive. Um, they're kind of a clear acrylic um, as opposed to those big bulky kind of lattice looking uh, gray gates that we had for 20 plus years. So um, as exciting as a, as a security gate system can be, um, we're, we're happy with what we've got here today. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so, um, so that's the other piece of infrastructure. We also had completion of our, our self-checkout system um, as reported in my director's report on page eight. Uh, there, we actually have some statistics for that now as well, which is really exciting. Um, we didn't have that kind of data immediately available to us in the past. But now we've got hour by hour data for each of our self checkout units. Um, they're all numbered as well, so we can keep track of which ones are performing better than others. That'll help us to analyze if the locations are appropriate um, for their current placement. Um, so that's an exciting uh, new resource. And as you can see from the statistics, they're all being used. Um, and they're scattered throughout the building. We've got two on the second floor. Um, the majority of them are on the first floor and we've got one on the lower level um, close to where BDU is. So um, we're really excited for this new equipment and our patrons are really taken to it. So that's kind of where we're at on the RFID project. Any questions about that? I don't have a question about the RFID. But I know one thing that I am curious about is when you change the sleeves, will you change how you display the media so that it's easier to find what you're looking for? Because I know that was one of Stuart's constant thoughts, constant suggestions. So I was just curious. Well, in terms of the shelving system for the compact disc collection um, was very expensive and we're not going to be replacing the shelving system for it because that collection's circulation has in fact um, gone down over the course of the last several years that that media, physical media is not circulating as strongly as it did um, years ago. However, um, we can reuse the existing shelving and um, we do think that this solution is in fact a, a more attractive way to display the collection and actually makes it maybe a bit more accessible. So by example, since you're interested, I will show you one of these cases here. So what we have here is one of these sleeves. They're very thin. Um, the packaging, we just removed the, the plastic cases, but you can see that one of the spine labels from the side of this two disc set has a place on the top of this. So it's very easy to browse what the title of the thing is. You have the, the benefit of the face out, but you also have all the name of, of the item at the top of it. So when you're browsing through a list of them, you can see them all much more readily. Um, it's a more attractive way of displaying the collection. And these acrylic sleeves will just, will be more, they're, they're prettier than, than the kind of, the jewel cases get yellow over time and they get worn and are much less attractive. They break, um, the little donuts that hold the disc in place break off and the discs get scratched. Um, this is just gonna be an overall better, better way to maintain those collections for the, for the remainder of their life. Um, but as I said before, um, this is really just for the single and double disc sets that are in jewel cases. 
Um, we analyze the other pieces in the collection. We're talking a lot about CDs here. I love CDs. We can talk about music all day. Um, but um, we're, we're not going to be affecting the, the, uh, the, the way that we house the other portions of that collection. The uh, box sets will remain in the same original packaging that they were. Um, Digipacks and other multi-disc sets, box sets that kind of come um, bound in other media are, are going to, we, we're not going to change that up. There's too much labor involved in that. But Anthony, okay. this is only the, as you say, the music, not the DVDs. No. That's a totally different, but aren't those still in, I haven't taken one out in a long time. Aren't those still in a jewel plastic case? They're in plastic cases as well. Um, uh, years ago, we had them in um, a special type of security case. Um, we currently do not have the security strips installed in those cases, but the, they are in a repackaged library specific case that helps them to not break. Um, DVD media um, storage cases have changed a lot in the last few years. They've gone to a, a far more recyclable type format that's not really appropriate for library circulation. So um, we do have them already repackaged as a matter of course, and uh, we're going to continue on with the packaging that we have for our DVD collection that seems to be working for us. Um, we could certainly Thank talk you. a lot about the presentation and uh, labeling of that collection, um, but I think we should move on to another topic here tonight. But that is what we're doing with the, with the CDs as part of the RFID project. Just the I, do have, I do have one additional question about the website. Will it be down for any period of time or does it magically appear whole when people are going to be using it? So um, we will create the brand new website as part of a, it will be created separately. Um, mm -hmm. And there will be a sort of, we'll call it a sandbox where we can kind of play, um, design it. Um, there'll be a focus group or there'll be focus groups that will be able to work on it, um, comment on it. We'll have them both running concurrently at what some point we'll advertise the new site so folks can take a look at it and provide mm -hmm. feedback on it in advance of its launch. Um, that will happen later this summer. Um, in terms of downtime, there, there will be a bit of downtime associated when the uh, do domain naming service, the DNS, has to change over. Um, mm -hmm. But there really, there, it would be nominal. It would be a matter of minutes potentially, and we will schedule that at a time when there would least likely be traffic to the site. Sure. So, yep. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Not quite like when the electricity is going to turn off at the library. Yes. <laughs> All right, anything else about the, the project updates? Okay, all right. So then I think the next item on the agenda is the director's report. So I will keep riffing with, with my talk. Um, there's a number of things that I could highlight this month. Um, obviously, one of our primary events in April has been um, our One Book Everyone Reads program. Um, the culmination of that programming was um, last week on April 14th when we hosted Charles Yu for our, um, our author presentation. And uh, we, that event was attended by 315 screens. Um, we're compiling all of the feedback that we received from that event. So our author programming has actually been really quite remarkable in this virtual environment this last year. And a number of our patrons have given us feedback that they hope that there's some way that we can continue to provide uh, the convenience of having digital participation in a lot of our programming. So as we're looking forward, that'll certainly be one thing that we'll want to have on our radar as one of our um, service model options going forward is the conveniences that have been introduced as part of the pandemic response plan, um, including parking lot pickup as well as virtual access to programming. Um, but uh, so far, we've had really strong feedback about the, um, uh, the OBER programming. Um, There's a whole range of series that we offered in, in this, um, from genealogy to Mahjong, to a really outstanding presentation about um, anti-Asian hate and xenophobia in the age of COVID. Um, There's some really outstanding conversations that we had around the book itself as part of our book discussions. Um, all in all, we feel that, that this year's um, Selection was really popular with our community and we've had some, some strong feedback about it as well. Um, 
do you, any of you have any comments about your, your individual experiences with our one book programming or any feedback about the, um, the event itself? The beauty of the xenophobia, the, the uh, workshop, the lecture that you had there is that it, the audience and they got them to participate. So that was good as opposed to being just somebody talking to you, they actually engaged. So I thought that was a good way to keep people involved and engaged. And I Thank you. I heard the author um, and I, I thought he, I thought it was well done. It's not quite like being in the auditorium or whatever, but um, it worked. It was good. Yeah. He, he was engaging. Thank you. Yeah. It was engaging and I thought uh, personally that the uh, best part was when he just talked and talked about himself and talked about what he'd gone through and puzzling through how to do the book and get it out and why he did it. So that, that part was really excellent. I think that's always interesting to uh, myself, a non-reader, what writers, you think that it just sort of appears, but their angst and their uh, trials and tribulations, are, I think are, it, it brings it to life, you know, or brings it to a reality, maybe. So I, yeah, I think that was good to hear him relate how, what worked for him and what didn't and going through his uh, process. Um, Did you get any negative feedback, Anthony, to the library? Um, the negative feedback that I've heard is a, a bit limited. I, I did hear some, okay. um, and I heard it from actually from from one of my trustees. Do you, Lisa, do you want to do you want to share your feedback? Uh, yeah, when I went to my water aerobics, I think one of the problems was is that we're used to hear. We would have liked to the author to have talked more, and that the questions could have been a little deeper and a little bit more engaging. Mm -hmm. what they were. Those were some of, I mean, but that's just myself. That was my thought. Cause I, I, I go to a book review a week at least either to New York public library or else I go to fan. And so I guess I'm looking at how they do it. And I just thought that it could have been a little bit more, I don't know, in terms of, that was just my thought. And, and mm -hmm. that's a, a, a point well taken. Um, just yeah. as, a, as a matter of background re regarding that, the, the author originally, the plan was that we were going to have a 30 minute presentation from the author as we typically do for our over program. And that was changed up um, at the last minute um, at the publicist's request who changed this to a Q&A format. And as a result, there was a hard pivot on the point of our staff and consultants to um, restructure the way that we had developed the program. Um, in an effort to try to meet with that. So I think it was, it was maybe not the way that we had planned it to be. And um, I think we learned a little bit about how we can establish a bit more structure for the programming, but sometimes we're not gonna be able to influence that. And I think no matter how we would have dug in on this particular instance, um, I think that, that it would have still just been, you know, well, this, I'm the author, I'm your guest, and this is what I wanna do. So this is how it's gonna be. So sometimes that happens. And I think, you know, I think we bounced um, as best as we could from that, but it, 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 we agree, it didn't, that didn't quite go exactly the way that we wanted it to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also appropriate to note, you know, when we created the uh, North Suburban Library Foundation author series a number of years ago, and we had uh, internationally recognized authors, um, Edward Albee, um, um, and many others, um, you know, the, the challenges of that sort of a program are always filled with unknowns because you're talking, you don't know ahead of time uh, exactly what the author wants to do or is most comfortable doing. And you have to be flexible and adaptive to what they would like to do. And so, Sometimes it just doesn't go quite as you imagined that it would. Um, and that's part of the, you know, the adventure that you're going into when you engage people who are well known, 
Um, actually, some of our authors are not as well known as what we had coming in for the for the um, uh, North Suburban Library Systems programs um, because we were drawing from the entire North Shore and it was a fundraising uh, activity to support the foundation. But the bottom line is that you're always going to have some unexpected uh, occurrences and unknowns that you just have to adapt to as they occur. And you know, this is a this is an effort which I think is is well appreciated in the community, but it takes a certain amount of flexibility to pull it off. So you know, those things happen no matter how well planned it is. Late changes are part of what you're dealing with just by running such a program. Yep. <laughs> But Marianne, we appreciate the friends and their support. So thank you. Absolutely. Yes. I think I think a lot of the workshops were really good. I didn't have time to see all of them, but I enjoyed the variety. Yes, thank you, Lisa. We're very grateful for the friends and their sponsorship of this, our signature program of the year. Um, and I get. I think that's all I had about Ober. Um, the next item I wanted to share with you all is um, there was a fair bit in my report actually about one of our ongoing community partnerships. So at the top of my um, report, I always talk about our strategic plan initiatives. And one of those is sustain our partnerships. I'm going to just do a mute here. Um, and um, uh, one of our, our ongoing partnerships that I'm really thrilled about is our relationship with the League of Women Voters, Will Met. Um, and we have had a long-standing um, book discussion uh, club, book club um, with them. And, and I wrote about uh, a little bit about our, our meeting um, in my report this month. But we also had a couple other sessions that we partnered with the league this month. Um, obviously our candidate forums, we were thrilled to be a part of that. Um, that was one of our, our main activities in March. Um, but we also had our um, Citizens Climate Lobby um, event that we worked in collaboration with the league on. Um, and that was also regarding one of the ballot initiatives on April 6th. So we continue to be really impressed by our relationship with the league and um, are grateful that we are able to sustain that. Um, in terms of other partnerships, today marked uh, my first of 10 meetings that I'm gonna be having with District 39. Um, I am going to be participating as a community member in District 39 strategic planning process. Um, so there were about 50 people on our call this afternoon. We had our orientation and onboarding meeting. And um, over the course of the next 10 weeks or so, we're going to be having a series of meetings um, where we're, I'm going to be learning an awful lot about um, the inner workings of uh, District 39 and our schools, um, about their strategic planning initiative. They've got a consultant that they're working with on this project. And I think um, this is going to be really um, informative for me, both as the library director in learning about um, one of our community partners, um, about our community, about our learners, um, but also about the strategic planning process of one of our other affiliate organizations in the community and how I can bring some of those strategies to us here at Wilmette Library. Um, so I don't have much more to share about that here today, but I'm very much looking forward to the process and I will be sharing more with you about that as that process moves forward. Um, Speaking of D39, um, we've had a really fabulous um, response to our partnership with D39 in terms of getting our students in the schools registered for library cards. Um, our program continued this month and we registered 383 students for their first library cards in Wilmette um, uh, in, gades, in grades uh, K through eight. So we're really thrilled um, about that. Um, and we'll continue to keep you updated on that. Um, what else can I tell you here from my report? I, I think I've got a point of information. Excuse yes. me. Those 383, those were their first library cards? They've registered for cards for the first time, yes. Wow. So a number, of, a number of students may not have already had them. They could be new to our community. They could have just mm -hmm. moved to town. Um, they maybe were using their parents' cards previously or whatnot. But since given that option at school registration, which is the point where they would have this option, it would kind of take them off mm -hmm. on a sidetrack. Do you have a Wilmette Library card is one of the questions. 
And if they say yes, it moves them on. If they say no, it can take them off to the side where they can enter their registration information and get pre-registered for a card. And That's then that great. is a cue to us to, um, to then go ahead and create those records. And then we mail the cards to the students. It's great, thank you. Anthony, I do, I do have one question. Uh, what was the main goal that was to be satisfied by, by the meeting? I mean, did, did they call, come to the library? Did you suggest that you meet with them and whatever? I mean, I, I don't understand what the goal was of the meeting. Um, uh, you mean the strategic planning meeting? With the, the, the no, the, yes, with the District 39. Is that something that usually happens? It's not, is it? Um, I, I'm not sure what historically D39 has done with engaging community partners, um, but mm -hmm. as part of this process this year, and, and I think D39 is doing a one-year strategic plan. Um, so their, their plan this time around is to engage, they had an all call to a, a number of uh, community organizations, and I responded um, to that and expressed mm -hmm. interest, and they selected me to be on the committee. Uh, the committee is also comprised of other members. I, I, one of the breakout rooms I was in today, I had a representative from the park district. Uh, there were some families that were participating, um, parents as well as students, um, mm -hmm. teachers and other faculty at, um, at the school district. So um, it's, they're trying to involve a number of stakeholders um, community-wide in their process. Okay. And obviously the end goal is, is a new strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Involving more of the community? Is that part of it, do you think? Involving stakeholders is a key element of it, yes. Yeah, okay, good. School districts have no uh, legislated requirement to conduct such planning. Libraries do. Um, as a part of the Illinois State Library's management of the per capita grant program, eligibility is connected to conducting a strategic plan every few years that applies to all public libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's no, there is no such requirement for school districts. So this is not uh, an event that occurs as frequently for public school districts um, because it's not mandated. Um, for public libraries, it is mandated. So that is a difference. It represents an interest of the District 39 board on their own initiative to conduct such an effort and to be as inclusive as, as they can be. But they're not mandated to do so as, as libraries are. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Um... I guess you know a couple a couple final points I can add from my director's report, and then I can open it up to you all. Um, um, we did have a policy committee meeting here recently. I just wanted to touch on that. Um, the, uh, just the pieces that um, that did come back related to our meeting room policy. Uh, the attorney thought overall that our policies look great and endorsed them. He did have a recommendation that we um, go back and reevaluate our meeting room policy, having having recently done that for a couple other peer libraries, he had a, a few recommendations for us in terms of structure and content for those policies. And he said, since you're doing a comprehensive review, there's a few things I might recommend that you add. Um, and I thought, you know, well, maybe this is something I could throw in here at the last minute if it were nominal um, without needing to call another committee meeting over it. However, his, uh, the, the draft policies that he shared with me were, were really comprehensive and actually quite alluring um, in their content. So I felt instead of trying to rush this thing and bring it before the committee or the, the whole board tonight for approval, I wanted to take it back before the staff to evaluate a few more of the details before I incorporated some of those changes, which I do think we're gonna move forward with. Um, so what I think um, as a matter of procedure, when the staff has had a chance to go through this, when I've had a chance to incorporate those changes um, and reflect with our stakeholders um, who have, can reflect upon the impacts, I will bring it before the policy committee again for another review. You'll have a chance to discuss it there in committee again before we take it to the board of the whole to discuss. Um, the other bits of the, of the policy that I hope to have ready for the next committee meeting um, will include our code of conduct, which we didn't look at um, at the last committee meeting. Um, as well as the introduction of the policies associated with policy four, 
which is our next chapter, and that relates to library cards and accounts. And I've been working with circulation manager Kim Hegland on that um, over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, so that's going to be um, a really refreshed policy, and I'm looking forward to sharing a bit more information about that with you here shortly. Um, then on to some other administrative details here um, in human resources. Um, we're working on um, trying to fill a few vacancies. Um, our technical services manager position um, did not net a finalist for us. Um, we've been working on trying to fill this position now for a few months, and our recruitment strategies have unfortunately not been able to land us with the perfect fit for the position. So I'm currently working with the team to try to evaluate what our best option is for trying to fulfill that role going forward. We have some ideas, um, so I'll hopefully have more information to share with you at our next meeting about that. Um, we also did just post for another vacancy in our digital services department. Um, one of our um, key training roles is our software training associate and um, uh, so that has been posted and we're going to advertise that a little bit more widely here this week. Um, the, the last piece I'll share is that um, we have a special project that we, we typically work on on a regular basis every couple of years and that is our salary structure survey. Um, we're going to be working with HR Source, our um, salary structure consultant. We'll be going through and analyzing every one of our positions and um, doing a market analysis and comparison to ensure that our rates are competitive with our peers. Um, and also with a, a portion of the nonprofit and for-profit sectors, as a few of our jobs do overlap into other industries and are not just library specific, um, whether that is IT or um, graphic arts or safety and security, um, that sort of thing. So there's, there's a range of, of roles that um, the HR source consultant is going to look at with us so that we can plan accordingly for future evaluation of our salary structure. And as you know, one of our long range plans is to ensure that we are able to um, effectively satisfy our requirement to get to minimum wage at $15 uh, by 2025. And we are currently on pace for that. Um, Anthony, what's the timing as to when you expect that evaluation, salary evaluation to be complete? The salary evaluation will be taking place over the course of the summer. Um, it will probably be complete by this fall. Okay, so it won't impact this year's budget coming up. Um, we will be building in our regular um, recommendations for updates to the salary schedule, and we can talk a bit more about that as we get into our budget discussions. Um, but the salary schedule does have a, an incremental plan to update to it, as well as our compensation plan as well. And the results of this, of this um, consulting project sets forth what the next steps are following um, the adoption of that new structure. So it has maintenance built into it and we're following the current maintenance plan from the previous structure. Um, I think that completes the, the broad summary of my report. Are there any individual questions that you have about the content of the report or anything else library related? Mm -hmm. If not, then we can turn over to some more broader library land related topics. Um, Fina, or I'm sorry, Jan. Jan. Um, do you have anything that you want to share with I'm us from ILA. Rails or ILA? Sure, just a couple things. Uh, you can still register to attend the Reaching Forward Illinois conference. And what they're doing this year is combining the Reaching Forward and the Reaching Forward South. And it's a $50 fee for both and you can find uh, what, what they're going to be doing on the I, um, ILA website. Um, one particular thing, especially since we had the, this one book, Everyone Reads, that I ran across, um, there was a survey done and I can't tell you where or when uh, because they didn't say that, but they looked to see what books were, were banned or challenged in 2020 at different libraries. And it turned out that the answer to that surprised me, maybe not uh, all of us, but the answer to that is that books with strong anti-racist messages aimed at kids and teens. Now we're talking about books that were challenged. Just something to throw out there to think about um, especially since we, Anthony put in that uh, we were supporting the Asian 
groups are in well met and uh, for anybody who came. So it's, it shocked me a little bit since there's been so much publicity about it, but it's something to think about. That's it. Anthony, what's the deadline to register if any of the trustees want to attend in terms of contact and Marty? Do should be they contact you? Um, or the ILA. Um, reach out to me. Let me let me know if you're interested, and let me know by end of week. Okay. okay. So that's for any trustees. Thank you. That's it. Do you have anything else to add regarding rails, Anthony? I, I don't. You talked about it earlier. Kind of, bit. yeah. Kind of, in terms of the latest policy. Um, the only other item that I would share with you is that um, trustees who are on the board in 2020 um, do have the, the requirement from Cook County to file their statement of economic interest. You should right. receive mm -hmm. an email to do so. Um, please do go in and take care of that before May 1st. I'm going to be logging in here um, at the end of this week to confirm that we've got everyone, um, everyone's records recorded for that. If you have any questions whatsoever about how to do so, um, please reach out to me and I can connect you with your resources at the county to complete that task. Um, okay. Let me just say something too. And then this will be the last thing for three of our trustees, but we hope that they will come just for the first part of the May meeting so that we can say goodbye. And we'd like to thank, do a formal thank you at that time. And so the trustee Rogers, trustee Wolf and trustee Johnson, thank you so much. We'll be saying more then. So I hope you, to see you then. Okay. I think I'm being thank there. Okay, thanks. That's a footnote. You need a quorum to open the meeting in May. I know. And <laughs> three trustees who are going off the board in the middle of that meeting don't show up. You may have be challenged to achieve that. So, what do uh, we need to do to bribe you to get there? <laughs> I don't know that it will take a bribe in my case, but the bottom line is <laughs> okay. the, the current board starts the meeting and then adjourns yes. that meeting after approval of the minutes and whatever else is necessary. And the new board uh, is sworn in and elects officers and proceeds. So for those of you who are new trustees, uh, you should be present for the entire meeting. The old, the retiring trustees and the continuing trustees open the meeting. Thank you, Ron. Okay. Is there any new business? Any old business? Do any of the observers have any comments that they would like to make? Then is there, a, I move that we adjourn the meeting at 716. Is there a second? I will second. Trustee seconds of the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call, Trustee Barshish? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshish, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? He left about 30 minutes ago. Okay. okay. Um, Trustee, Trustee Riddle? Yes, and I also wanted to say um, that I really appreciate everyone reaching out to me last month and for your generous and thoughtful words. It brought me a lot of comfort to know that this is a board that I, you know, I may not know you all for so long, but you really it made me feel so, so comforted and um, supported when my father passed away. And I really appreciate your words, those who reached out to me and the generous, generous donation to St. Francis on my dad's behalf. So I, I wanted to say that before, before we adjourn. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Rogers. Yeah. 
Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Thank you and have a good night. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam President, for a very nice uh, meeting and you as well, Anthony. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank good you. Good night. Thank you.